Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. Remember to subscribe to our free podcast so you won't miss any of our inspiring content. Here is episode 131. That's one of the stories that's closest to my heart that illustrates this sort of ethic of self-directed learning, where there's a lot of taking initiative. There's a lot of following your curiosities and interests because that is what naturally motivates you the most. Benjamin Franklin once said, Do not curse the darkness, rather light a candle instead. If you are ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for the luminous mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Blake Bowles. Blake builds exciting alternatives to traditional education for self-directed young people. He directs the company Unschool Adventures and is the author of The Art of Self-Directed Learning, Better Than College and College Without High School. Blake and his work have appeared on TEDx, The Huffington Post, USA Today, The New York Times, BBC Travel, Fox Business, Ignite, NPR Affiliate Radio, and blogs of The Wall Street Journal and TheWire.com. Welcome, Blake. Thanks for having me, Rebecca. I'm so excited that we finally have connected and we're, <laughs> you're able to join us because I think you have the most interesting paradigm shift I've ever heard of. <laughs> However, before we get started, please tell our audience a little bit more about yourself. Sure. I'm 33, born and raised in California, and since college, I haven't lived in the same place for more than about six months. Uh, kind of a nomad. <laughs> and that's a kind of a fun lifestyle. Do you love it? Yeah, I do love it. I've been doing a lot of writing and thinking about it recently, but I'm going to keep doing it for a while. Great. <laughs> Great. So tell us a little bit more about like the inspiration behind your message. Yeah, my story kind of starts in high school when I was a straight A student. I went to kind of regular suburban public schools in California. And I remember, you know, that I did well in school, but I was pretty fundamentally bored by it and frustrated. Uh, but all of that just sort of happened in the background of my mind as I was going through the normal college prep motions. So I went to the best college I could get into, which was UC Berkeley. And I chose the major that sounded the most impressive and exotic, which was astrophysics. And I went and I studied astronomy and physics and math for a couple of years until I realized that I was not going to make a very good research scientist. I just did not love math enough to be a good physicist. Um, so as I was considering options, including like dropping out to become a snowboard instructor, uh, <laughs> I was I was very luckily presented with a John Taylor Gatto book, the New York City public school teacher who won all of the awards for being a great teacher. And then he quit and he said he no longer wanted to make a living hurting kids anymore. And that was just like a big shock to my system because I had this backup plan of being becoming a high school science teacher. And when I read that, I was like, maybe I should not even touch the school system, whether public or, or private at all, and do something completely different. And so, yeah, reading Gatto halfway through my college career and then reading everything else that Amazon.com suggested, if you like Gatto, you should also read this, that introduced me to uh, democratic free schools like the Sudbury Valley School, and introduced me to unschooling and sort of demystified the whole concept of homeschooling to me, which I always thought was just, you know, a thing for weirdos. <laughs> and yeah, it just really opened up this world of alternative education. And pretty quickly, I realized this is what is important to me. I need to study this full time. I designed a major to study alternative education, convinced two professors to sponsor me. They essentially gave me carte blanche to, to do whatever I wanted for the next two years in college and still graduate with the bachelor's. Oh, wow. uh, so that's what I did. Yeah, I had a very self-directed second half of college. And after graduating, I continued working in the fields of outdoor and experiential and alternative education. So it, it started right there halfway through college. Yeah, I thought it was such an interesting story because, you know, you go from very traditional public school to like the outsets of unschooling. And, and we all know that there's obviously different degrees of you know, everyone does their education different. Some people just basically do school at home versus, you know, those that get out and travel. So that's awesome. So and did studying John Taylor Grotto, did it instill this passion for this type of education? You know, 
You just sound like you became a voracious reader on that. I want to know yeah, more about that I, passion behind that. It's one of those weird moments in life where something just becomes incredibly clear. I haven't had many more of those. Yeah, when people say, like, where does the, the passion come from or how do you ignite your passion? I don't know how to answer that question. I can just relate my personal story, but it's it's sort of like, you know, feeling like you've been asleep for a long time and then somebody kind of claps their hands and you suddenly wake up and you realize something that is important or meaningful that, uh, I, again, for me, I think what happened was I had this this experience of just being generally frustrated and, and listless and, and bored in school and realizing at that moment when I started reading Gatto and other authors that there was so much potential being wasted, not only the potential that I had to be a much more engaged student in school instead of sitting there waiting for the teacher to go through some lesson that I didn't really care about or I'd already done on my own. Uh, so, you know, school either went too fast or too slow for me. Too fast, meaning like in biology class, I wanted to, to focus on the theory of spontaneous generation, like how life can arise from non-life. And like that just seemed fascinating to me, but we, we had to zip through it. And so there wasn't time to go deep into the juicy stuff. There was no chance for mastery in school. And then on the other hand, more commonly, it would just go too slow. It was stuff that I could be doing on my own. I could do the work like in class. You know, the homework was done before I even left. And so that just felt like a really frustrating experience where I was sort of forced to work at the, the median pace. And I was forced into this group work. And so I'm sure much of this just reflects my own personality and hangups. Like I am... <laughs> definitely a diehard individualist and I like to do stuff on my own. I'm, I feel very entrepreneurial and I have for a long time. Uh, but I think that it affects a lot of young people in school. And so when I, when I read Gatto, it just dawned on me that there's so much human potential and human capital that is being wasted just as a byproduct of the school system. And so that's where this passion came from, just realizing that there was this big unsolved problem that I could maybe assist with or put some dent in. And so that's where my inspiration for writing came from, uh, and that's where a lot of my inspiration for working with young people, especially the middle school, high school, early college age range comes from. That's great. And you talk about being bored in school. I think that many youth or young people feel like that that's just a normal thing for them to hate learning to be bored in school type of thing. And, you know, I definitely don't condemn you for, you know, not finding that passion. But a lot of it was because just trying to keep up with the system, you know, what that bureaucracy expects versus what the child really needs. And what a what a mindless, terrible system to instill this you know, sense that learning is a, a chore, learning is hard, learning is terrible. You know, it's not, learning is hard. Uh, but it doesn't need to be something that we like actively avoid, like the plague. And yeah, and just to to essentially uh, zap all you know, of the it's just uh, to zap all this and to paint a picture of life as this like boring trudge through different layers of bureaucracy. Like what an uninspiring way to to raise entire generations of young people. Yeah. Ugh. Well, and I want to know more about like, you know, once you read John Taylor Grotto, how did you get such supportive professors to kind of come behind that and allow you to do a self-directed college education? Honestly, it wasn't so much about them supporting me as me annoying the administration enough into letting me do this individual major. They tried to funnel me into all these other programs that would not give me the, the full freedom and autonomy I was looking for. And so I just sort of pestered the administration enough. And then I had pre-existing relationships with one astronomy professor and one education professor. You need to get two people to sign off on your plan, and then you have essentially free reign to study whatever you'd like, and you have to write a, a senior thesis paper. And so I wrote a really crappy 40-page senior thesis paper called Education and the Individual, which every time I look back on it, I cringe a little bit. But I tell myself <laughs> that I had to get all the bad writing out to get the potentially some decent writing in later in my life. Exactly. Sometimes we, we have to start from zero, right? So great. Everyone. Yeah. So tell us how you feel like your overall paradigm has changed about learning over time and with experience. We've kind of touched on it a little but You know, what do you want our audience to come away with? Uh, somebody who I follow online, his name is Will Richardson, and he's a former teacher and educator and teacher trainer. And now he's a, an author and a sort of critic um, who's still connected to the traditional system. And he emphasizes the difference between preparing kids to be effective learners 
and preparing kids to be taught effectively. And I feel like that distinction is crucial and it's captured in the really popular aphorism that we attribute to Mark Twain, who says, I never let my schooling get in the way of my education. And so this is largely what I took away from reading Gatto too. He said that schooling and education are two different things that we commonly conflate. But really, an education is something that you have to give to yourself, whereas a schooling is something that is done to you. And so I think that that's been my biggest paradigm shift is separating the notion of schooling and education or schooling and learning uh, or teaching and learning. They're not the same thing. Learning is a process that the learner has to buy into. Teaching is something that we just sort of do mechanically or as a part of a sort of large scale process. And teaching is, you know, people like teaching because it's quantifiable and testing is quantifiable. But fundamentally, neither one of those is what matters in the long term for most people's actual lives. It is their capacity to be a learner and to figure out the problems that they have, to do research on their own, to gather resources, to talk to people. That is what matters. That's what most people do for the rest of their lives. We aren't in any situations where we are formally being instructed. We are not constantly being tested about our knowledge or skills, at least not formally. We're, we're tested informally all the time. Uh, so really, the focus should be on learning and helping people become learners. And to me, that means becoming self-directed learners, because largely we do all of our learning on our own through our own means, gathering our own resources, not completely as you know individuals. We are definitely interconnected, but we have to start the process ourselves. We have to be self-directed. It's just like a fact of human nature. And we don't talk enough about learning. We talk about teaching. We talk about testing because those are familiar concepts. They're measurable, but they're not what matters most. Yeah. Testing is definitely not something in the end, you know, later down the road, you're like, oh, I'm glad I was tested on, you know, so many presidents or whatever. It's really the connections that you make. Another thing that I kind of want to get your opinion on is the difference between mentoring and teaching. Do you feel like there's a difference there? Talked about schooling, that something's done to you versus, you know, that collaboration is really important which I think is kind of funny with testing. They don't want you, you looking at your partner's thing, but in a daily life, people are collaborating all the time that they don't call that cheating. They call it collaboration. Yeah, yeah, I, com I completely agree. And uh, another concept that's been thrown out there, which I feel is a great lit litmus test for anyone uh, to figure out if they're more concerned about teaching or learning is why don't we have, so this is the concept for like public schools. Why don't you let every test be an open phone test. We're familiar with open book tests, but how about you let everyone have a smartphone or a tablet or a laptop and let them use that without restriction during a test? And, you know, immediately anyone who's part of the school system says, oh, you can't do that. That's essentially cheating. They can just look up anything they want and, you know, they're going to plagiarize. And I say, that is exactly how life is. And yes, you know, we need to instill that plagiarism is, you know, intellectual stuff, just not a good thing. But Life is an open book and an open phone test. And so that is, I am a big fan of that concept. Like, let's make every test, give the kids their smartphones and let them go at it because that's how we are going to operate in the rest of life. And mentoring for, versus teaching, uh, it's the same thing. A mentor is somebody who helps their mentee see all the different options that are on the table and then make the best choice, the most informed decision about which path to take. A teacher is somebody who has an agenda of some end product that they already know that they want to instill, uh, which could look you know, like a common core standard, some very specific target. And there are times when teaching is very important and very appropriate, but I think those are the times when the student elects the teacher. And that's more of a mentorship situation, when it's consensual in both directions. Uh, so, yeah, I think that mentorship is essentially a proxy for being a good teacher or being a good educator. Yeah, kind of a lecture type style teaching where you just spout out your information and hope that whoever's hearing you gathers, you know, but you yeah. don't really you don't really focus on what they need versus, you know, what you just want to spout out type of thing. Is and, how I and, and again, there, there, I think there's a place for lectures. Like I had some really great influential uh, lectures when I was in college and maybe a couple in high school, like mostly not. But the point is the learner like voluntarily signing up for this lecture experience. If they're not, if they are being forced into it or they are forcing themselves into it through some kind of internal 
uh, you know, I, I must, I should Guilt go to this thing. lecture. Yeah, yeah. Be, because, you know, their parents or their professors or their counselors have said, like, you have to go to these lectures. But they're going and they're not learning anything. They're just falling asleep in class or playing with their phones. Then, yeah, that is a situation of low engagement. Like, that is the enemy. That's what we have to try to avoid. Yeah. It's just wasted potential, wasted time. Exactly. Oh, love it. So tell me a little bit more about your mentors. I mean, you mentioned a couple with John Taylor Grotto and then also the college professor, but how did they make a significant difference in your success? Yeah, you know, John Taylor Grotto was largely an intellectual influence through the books that he's written. I'd say that two of my other biggest mentors have been outside of the realm of formal education, and they're the directors of two summer camps that I've worked for for a long time. First one is Jim Wiltons, who started Deer Crossing Camp, a wilderness camp up near Lake Tahoe in California. And the other one is Grace Llewellyn, who runs Not Back to School Camp, which is the summer camp for teenage unschoolers that come from all across North America to hang out with each other for a week or two in Oregon or Vermont at the, uh, in the back to school time period, like late August, early September. And I went to Deer Crossing Camp as a young person, and uh, I went back to work there as an instructor and assistant director. And I've worked at Not Back to School Camp for about 10 years. And uh, these two people have started these incredible little communities, these temporary communities, you could call them intentional communities, that are very different. And I felt like I've gotten a huge education by getting to work at each of them. Uh, At Deer Crossing Camp, you are taking kids out into a real wilderness situation. You're doing kind of traditional outdoorsy activities like sailing or rock climbing or backpacking. But there's this whole hidden curriculum of essentially positive psychology, helping young people think proactively. And one of the big things that happens at the camp is you cannot say the words, I can't. Instead, you have to say that phrase backwards, which is Tanaki. And so there's this whole story about the Tanaki monster, and it works extremely well for 11-year-olds. That's how old I was when I went there, to get them into this mindset of uh, proactive thinking, which I think is different from positive thinking, which can be a little wishy-washy sometimes. And so it has this whole hidden curriculum of psychology underneath it that happens through the guise of fun outdoors activities. And so getting to be a part of that camp, both as a camper and as an instructor and and later assistant director, has been a major influence on me. And the director of the camp who created all this um, has definitely been one of my biggest mentors. On the other side of things, not back to school camp, that created by Grace Llewellyn, who wrote the Teenage Liberation Handbook, which is a fantastic book for anyone you know, who's into unschooling, especially figuring out how to do unschooling with teenagers. She has created this incredible place that brings together young people who are self-directed learners. And it's like a totally different camp. It's much less structured. <laughs> there are more hippie bonding activities, which is my own phrase for what <laughs> goes on there. Uh, and so I've had this dual education through getting to work at summer camps. And those have been some of my other biggest influences. Well, and one of the things that I love about camps, and definitely want your take on it afterwards, is that, you know, the whole thing of I can't, but you're also putting the kids in a situation. I mean, even going without air conditioning is a struggle, you know, for kids our day and age, but you're putting them in a situation where they're having to do some really hard things, you know, like the rock climbing and all that is physically taxing. It's mentally, Mm -hmm. it naturally creates self-esteem because you're having them do these (laughs) difficult things. We're in our fuzzy world anymore. You know, we want to tell kids how wonderful they are, but they really can't grasp self-esteem until they do really hard things with that attitude of, I can do this. Yeah, I agree. Uh, You know, real self-esteem comes through real accomplishments that have not been made easy for you. And so something else that I think summer camps, what makes summer camps increasingly valuable is that they are a sort of antidote to the helicopter parenting or I was just introduced to another term to snow plow parenting you know imagine parent you know essentially plowing all the snow out of the way so a kid can walk on a nice pristine path instead of having to trudge through the snow and yeah, build their it, muscles up you know <laughs> yeah exactly like some appropriate amount of struggle is required to build actual self-esteem and I also think that just by nature of uh, summer camps uh, being sleepaway camps, where you go and for the first time, usually you are away from your family, your home, your familiarity, and you are living with other people who you have to learn how to get along with. Summer camps will just, they have this perennial power to uh, develop independence, responsibility, and actual self-esteem. That's why I'm such a huge fan of them. And I'm also a fan of international travel. 
group travel for that exact same reason. Well, let's talk about a little bit of your services. First of all, I would love it if you told our audience a little bit more about your books and kind of what each one entails, and then we'll move into those. I mean, which came first, the books or the services that you do with your (laughs) world schooling? The first book in the company came at roughly the same time, 2008. And so just as a brief backstory, I worked in outdoor education for a couple of years after college, essentially taking groups of fifth graders in California out on hikes and teaching a little bit of natural science stuff for three to five days. And I liked that a lot because I was getting kids out of the classroom doing stuff that they were really automatically engaged with. But for me personally, just having a group of kids for three to five days is way too high turnover. As soon as I got to know them, then they they left and another group came in. So it was a little bit too industrial for me. And so uh, I had a little quarter life crisis and ran away to South America for three months and got my heart stolen by Buenos Aires, Argentina, just the entire country of Argentina, a magical place. And so on that trip, I also started doing some writing because I had three months of unadulterated free time. And that writing turned into some thoughts about education and college because I'd had this really great college experience. And I had also started working with these homeschoolers and unschoolers through Not Back to School Camp. And I had noticed that a lot of them said, oh, yeah, like I have friends who, you know, they homeschooled or unschooled when they were young, but then their parents put them back into high school because they said that was the only way that you could go to college is if you have a good high school background. I would say, but you're going to college, right? And, you know, you're 17 and you just got into your top choice college and you've been unschooled your entire life. You've never even been to school. They say, yeah, that's right. And I said, well, So what's the problem here? I just saw this sort of disjuncture. And so I started writing There's a lot of myths in there, right? Yeah. There's a lot of myths about what you can or cannot do if you don't have traditional credentials in K through 12 or even traditional college credentials. So I started writing during the South America trip. And uh, what came out was the manuscript for my first book, College Without High School, A Teenager's Guide to Skipping High School and Going to College. And so I guess the book was first. But at roughly the same time, Uh, I was searching around for new job opportunities because I didn't want to keep doing outdoor education. I wanted to keep traveling internationally. And I was kind of tired of working for other people. And so smashed that all together. And what ended up coming out was my company, Unschool Adventures. So since 2008, when we led our first six-week trip to Argentina with nine teenage unschoolers, that has been my main bread and butter. That's how I sort of keep myself afloat and have a good time along the ways. And so uh, I run one or two trips each year for teenagers or other young adults who are self-directed learners who don't go to regular school. And so that's what I've been doing since 2008. And then since then, I've also been writing. Uh, My second book was called Better Than College, How to Build a Successful Life Without a Four-Year Degree. And most recently, I wrote The Art of Self-Directed Learning, uh, which is a summary of a lot of stories and illustrative uh, kind of vignettes that I've picked up about what that weird phrase self-directed learning even means, because I think it's a lot better than the phrase unschooling, which just, it doesn't mean anything because it is defining something by its opposite. You know, it just sounds kind of like rebellious and counterculture, but doesn't really tell you anything about what unschoolers do. I think self-directed learning is a much better phrase. Yeah, definitely. And even saying self-directed learning over homeschooling, they're doing their learning at home, but they're not necessarily always at home or getting their education from their parent or whatever. It comes from a lot of different places. So um, one of the things that I thought was interesting is how you got out hiking and doing some of those things and teaching science. I just interviewed a guy who talked about how important, he actually says the desk is the enemy to the brain. Did you find that that maybe when you're out and you're with those kids, you know, and that movement and everything that they're soaking things in a little better than what you would get in a classroom? I think that travel is just such a natural incubator for learning. If you take a teenager and you drop her into Buenos Aires, Argentina, and do not lead her around, you know, carrying a little orange flag, like some sort of highly scheduled, you know, tour operator. But instead you say, all right, you and your two other friends, you know, you have free reign for the next four hours, go find yourself some lunch and do something interesting. You know, you automatically need to figure out where you are, uh, what the resources are around you. If you don't know what the resources are, how to find them, you have to ask yourself, well, what do I even want to do with the time of my life? What's interesting and fun? You need to make risk management decisions. All of this is a proxy for the learning process and for self-directed learning. And so 
yeah, the kind of trips that I like to run are really about becoming an independent traveler. It's not just going from one pre-scheduled site or landmark to the next. Uh, that bores me, and that's expensive. And I want to bring young people to a place, do a little bit of group activities together. Like, yeah, let's go for a hike together. Let's go explore this cool place together. And then say, all right, the rest of the day is yours. Go have a good time. Do the same thing that I did when I was 14, when I got to go to Chile for a month and do a homestay. Like, I had a lot of personal exploration time. That is what I, I remembered, not the, the highly scheduled stuff at the beginning when we did our orientation. So teenagers, they want to hang out with other teenagers. They want to learn socially, not from adult authority figures. At least that's not their top priority. So that's the way that I like to help teenagers travel. And it's just an automatic, easy situation. It's a natural learning medium. Travel is the best thing ever. Yeah. For like getting a kid to feel passionate again. Well, and your senses are all alive. You know, when you drop somebody in a country where the, the language is different and the food is different and, you know, the way that the society is structured is way different. Uh, definitely. Yeah, um, the foreign language barrier to navigate. It's just, you know, such an, you want to talk about, you know, relevant learning or, you know, having purpose for your learning. It's like learning a foreign language when you have no idea how to order a hamburger. You know, yeah. that, that, is, that is as relevant as it gets right there. I am hungry. I need to communicate with this person. And so I'm going to learn this foreign language. Yeah. Oh, wow. I love it. Before we go on, let's listen to this message. Recently, the Luminous Mind became an affiliate for EduSense, which offers tremendous discounts on educational supplies. I personally use EduSense to purchase our family supplies because of their great prices, responsive shipping times, and best of all, the chance to earn EduBucks, which I use towards future purchases. Who doesn't love a great deal within a deal? To get a 90% savings on your EduSense materials, go to theluminousmind.net and click on the sponsor page to find the affiliate link. Start using EduSense to illuminate your educational experience. Welcome back to The Luminous Mind with Blake Bowles and Unschooling Adventures. You talked about your last book, some of those successes that you've seen with uh, this style of learning. Why don't you go ahead and give us some of those, you know, successes or what do they call them? Testimonials, I guess, of your schools and then also your books that you've written. Well, you know, the stories are more relating the successes of young people who I've had the privilege of meeting and working with. So just to pull one out of the hat, there's a story that Ken Danford, who is the founder of North Star, a really cool organization in Western Massachusetts for self-directed teenagers, um, he relates a lot, and I got it from Ken. There was a, a young guy named Jonah who went to North Star. He was a middle school dropout. He had totally hated school, and he essentially went to this place where it's like a resource center. North Star is just like a YMCA where you can just drop in hang out with other teenagers. There's a bunch of books on the wall. Uh, there are adults around who will help you if you ask them. And there's volunteer college students who are teaching classes and workshops most days. And so there's a lot of resources, but none of them are forced upon you as a teenager. And so Jonah, this middle school dropout, comes to North Star and he just hangs out for a couple of years. You know, the kind of stuff that makes a parent feel really nervous. Yeah. You know, when they see their kid just hanging out or just playing Minecraft or just sort of like idly reading some books or browsing the internet. But that's what Jonah did for a couple of years until he finally pulled a book off the shelf that was a sort of intro to general science concepts, like a survey of science. And out of everything he might have gotten interested in, he developed an interest in chemistry. And he just started diving into the field of chemistry in a very self-directed way. He read books, he read stuff on the internet, he actually got textbooks about chemistry and started going through them. Uh, until he figured out that he had kind of hit a limit with how much he could teach himself on his own. And so he was looking around for the next opportunity to keep learning chemistry. And he realized that a really good opportunity was sitting in front of his face. In Western Massachusetts, they were very close to the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, a big public university that has introduction to chemistry courses. 
And he said, well, I'm only, I think he was only 14 or 15 at this point. And he said, I'd really love to take this chemistry class, but I'm not able to enroll as a student. I'm too young. I think the auditing process was difficult or impossible. And so what he did, and I, this is the part of the story I love the most, is he sent an email to the professor. You can get a professor's email address just off of you know, no, the university not... website. Exactly. Yeah, it's not difficult. It's public information. He introduced himself. He said, I'm Jonah. I'm 14. I'm super interested in chemistry. I've been teaching myself through these various mechanisms, but I'd love to take your class because I'm just super interested in this content matter. Is there any way that I could sit in on your chemistry class as an unofficial student? So, you know, Rebecca, how many emails do you think this intro chemistry professor gets like this per year none right <laughs> yeah yeah somebody's saying like please can i take your intro you know everyone else is there because it's a prereq for their their major and this kid is like please let me take your chemistry course <laughs> and so it's flattering and it's also genuine in this way that i think inspires people to help you out and to enter into these mentorship situations or these informal teacher situations so of course the professor said yes and jonah went in he did the whole course. He did all the assignments and took the test. He did not get official credit for it, but he got a letter of recommendation at the end. And the professor said, you can take this to, if you enroll here at the college, you can take this uh, to the next uh, level college, you know, chemistry professor and consider it like a, a sort of ticket to, uh, you know, say that you've done the prereqs for the course. So that's one of the stories that I've, that's closest to my heart that illustrates this sort of ethic of self-directed learning where there's a lot of taking initiative. There's a lot of following your curiosities and interests because that is what naturally motivates you the most. It's a lot of figuring out what resources you have at your disposal. You know, self-directed learning can sound like self-isolated learning, something that only diehard individualists do and you have to do everything on your own. Like that's a complete fabrication. Uh, yeah understanding. Self-directed learning is really about being a more connected person, a more connected learner than you would be in the classroom where it's just you and the teacher and a very one-way information transfer happening. A self-directed learner like Jonah is somebody who goes out and finds every resource they can, books, YouTube videos, podcasts, college courses, even if you can't sign up as an official student, your peers, your adults, working professionals, the entire world is your classroom. And I feel like once you figure that out, once that realization dawns on you, you just realize how much fundamental power you have as an individual to solve your own problems and do your own research and just kick ass at life instead of being dependent upon other people to give you permission for you know the next hoop you need to jump through. Yeah. Well, and that follows those students the rest of their lives where they're not going to turn into the bored adult that has the mortgage and, you know, is just doing the job that they hate just because that's kind of what society's told them they need to do. They're going to have a life full of passion. <laughs> yeah. And so and people talk about, you know, education being a positive social good. That's why we should have public funding for education. It's a positive externality. That's what an economist would say. And I think those are potentially true statements if education is done well. Yeah, because if we have more people, more Jonas in the world, then yes, like that's the kind of person I want to hire like as my lawyer or my kid's rock climbing instructor or, you know, who I want to collaborate with on a business project or, you know, if that's the person, you know, working at the DMV, that is the person who I want in my society, not the person who has yeah, all this resentment and frustration from feeling very disempowered throughout their, their schooling and education. Yeah. I thought you said a, an interesting thing, too, when you're talking about Jonah, is that the parent that's worried because he's just kind of in a bored place, but most of our kids are in a bored place with school, but they were actually watching him, you know, like you said, unhook himself and kind of just kind of take a break for a minute. I mean, don't you think that maybe there needs to be some boredom? Them to really spark like you know those thoughts of like what are my interests instead of just keeping him busy he can't even have those thoughts you know because he's so busy learning about stuff that is boring to him I mean talk about yeah <laughs> a little bit yeah, of that I, I, I completely agree and anytime that we talk about alternative systems of education homeschooling unschooling alternative schools whatever uh, we have to hold them up against the current standard the current reality of what else might your kid be doing and so, yeah, homeschooling is not perfect. Unschooling is, is not a silver bullet. But 
if the other option is going to be sitting bored and frustrated in the classroom and being negatively socialized in many ways by school. You know, everyone thinks socialization is such an issue with homeschooling, but can we talk about like the many ways that kids are negatively socialized, you know, in big institutions, like, you know, a giant 2000 person high school, like I went to. So first of all, we have to be like realistic with our, our expectations. And second of all, yeah, the concept that you're talking about, Rebecca, is de-schooling, which is a word within the unschooling community to recognize the fact that if you've been part of this highly structured uh, school system for, especially for a while, that yeah, you need a cooling off period before you can, you know, you're essentially transferring yourself from an, a system of extrinsic motivation to a system of intrinsic motivation, and that does not happen overnight. If you're used to a system of sticks and carrots to motivate you, then you have to kind of press reset and let the computer reboot before you can get into a state of self-motivated, self-directed learning. And so there's this rule of thumb in the unschooling community that for every year that your kid has been in school, give that kid at least one month of time to de-school. And what that means is place no expectations on them whatsoever. Like let them play Minecraft, let them watch Netflix, let them do stuff that feels really scary to us as kind of, you know, mostly Western educated members of society who value the Protestant work ethic and think that, you know, we should always be working towards something. You know, I'm a a goal setter person myself, but I recognize that like the mental necessity of taking time away from that very goal oriented Western set of expectations for myself. And so that's what de-schooling is about, and that's what Jonah is going through. And I know a lot of kids who do that and a lot of parents who are really terrified by that prospect. But, you know, I've never – I'm yet to hear a story of a kid who, you know, is in school and then it's like, hi, i got to get out of here. So they start unschooling, and the parents place no expectations on the kid. And for the rest of that kid's life, that kid does nothing you know, just sits oh, in their plays parents' video basement. games. <laughs> yeah, play, just plays video games and eats flaming hot Cheetos and just, you know, never moves out of the house, has no desire to have any independent life. I've never heard a story of that. Uh, of course, maybe that's because, you know, those kind of stories are covered up. It's a giant conspiracy in the unschooling <laughs> world. We have to admit that possibility. But I don't think it's true. I think that we just need to give young people enough time, uh, space, and resources to rediscover the system of intrinsic motivation. Yeah. One thing I want to add to the child needs to de-school himself, but the parent, I mean, I was brought up in the traditional system. So my idea of what I think education is, is completely different. You know, so it's taken me a little bit of time too. So parents got to expect that they're going to have to de-school themselves and and have faith in that process of de-schooling. So let's kind of go on. I, I want to hear about what you feel like the benefit for families and communities and schools could be if we just adopted more of a self-directed education type philosophy? Uh, That's a tough question because, you know, what does it mean to adopt a self-directed education philosophy? What do the institutions look like if they become more self-directed? What does a teacher become if a teacher is about promoting self-directed learning instead of just imparting a, a standard curriculum? You know, there's lots of different ways to interpret this. I do not assume to have any of the big answers to this, because there's a lot of really smart people thinking about how to reform the education system. Uh, One answer that I I think about a lot is we have to send a ballistic missile into the concept of one right education system. You can sense we have this notion that there is one right system that's out there waiting to be discovered. When you talk about something like homeschooling or unschooling, and people immediately go on guard and they say, well, well, that can't work for everyone. You know, I know families that there's no way they could homeschool or unschool. And I say, yes, of course, obviously, you know, homeschooling, for example, like really benefits from having one parent who works and another parent who can stay at home. It benefits from a certain uh, level of material resources, uh, a certain culture. And so, yes, that is not the silver bullet. And then you talk about Montessori schools and they say, well, that couldn't work for everyone. You're like, yes, you know, (laughs) duly noted. And so this idea that one system should work for everyone is just ludicrous. And that is the first thing that needs to be done away with. And then if you get past that, then you can see that what is really going to benefit a large number of people is a highly diverse system of educational options. 
you know, I think there should be, instead of, you know, when you're thinking about what you're going to do with your kid for their, you know, K through 12 experience, uh, there shouldn't just be like two or three local options. Essentially, the public school, the public college prep school, the private college prep school, and then maybe like the so-called alternative school for bad kids, and maybe like a Montessori school, but that goes up to, you know, third grade, and then it stops there. Like, that is a pathetic number of options. Yeah, it is. And there, sh- there should be like... As many options for schooling and education as there are options for breakfast cereal in the supermarket. Yeah. Uh, there should be the homeschool support group, the unschool support group, the, the like highly disciplined military school, the Montessori school, the, you know, there's always going to be some like corporate, you know, kind of McDonald's mega school out there, which is essentially what we have as public schools right now. You know, everything, a full spectrum of educational options, both formal and informal, that you can pick and choose from. And it's it's not a sort of you have to go all in on one of these. You can sort of more piece together a custom fit experience. I think just pushing the system more towards that would be one of the best things you could do to support self-directed learning. Yeah, I would think, too, that we get away from calling other schools, other choices as alternatives, you know, because uh, it's exactly. really not, it's That's just tough. another school, not an alternative. And, and you just made me realize that my entire life, my entire adult life, I have been promoting the, the one right system idea by using the phrase alternative education, because what is an alternative, but not an alternative to the one right system? Ugh. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> hey, so I want to hear more about, talked about you being a really goal-oriented person, a really goal-oriented person. I can't say that. Well, Good. you have a new goal for yourself. Yeah, right? exactly. So a real goal-oriented goal person. Tell us a little bit what habits you feel like have been really helpful in your personal life. And then I want to know the why behind why you publicly post those goals on your website. Yeah, well, I'll start with just where I got this whole goal setting ethic. It was from that summer camp, Deer Crossing Camp, which is still in operation. It's still a great camp. And the director of the camp has a really long list of personal goals. And he was inspired to do that by this guy named John Goddard, who at age 14 sat down at his kitchen table in Los Angeles and wrote out a list of more than 100 life goals. It was a lot of Indiana Jones type stuff, like mountains he wants to climb or parts of the the world he wants to explore. And that whole notion of just like writing down your goals instead of keeping them locked up in your head really took hold with me through the mechanism of this summer camp. And so when I started working at that camp, I started my own goal list. I started with just having it down in a notebook, which was a really good first step, just getting it out of my head and downloading it into analog reality was important to kind of know if I was bullshitting myself or not. And just to see it written out has this certain magic. But I didn't feel like that went far enough as far as accountability is concerned. I felt like it's still really easy to write down a goal that you have that Maybe it's something that you really want to do. It you know, really titillates you and you're like, I want to make this happen in my life. But if it's only in your personal notebook, then you can still kind of back get away. Back out of it. Yeah, you can back out of it. You can you know, say like, well, I'll do that later, five years later, 10 years later, and then you're dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I don't remember exactly uh, where I got the idea from. I know I did not come up with it myself. But I said, I'm going to put my goal list online. And if people visit my website and they see my goal list, they say, oh, Blake says he wants to hike the Pacific Crest Trail. That will lodge that idea into some people's heads. And the next time they see me, they'll say, hey, you said you wanted to hike the Pacific Crest Trail. Like, are you still going to do that? Or like, how are you preparing for that? And although that doesn't happen very often in reality, it does happen sometimes. And just that, just knowing that there's people out there who have read that I'm said I'm going to do something motivates me to do that thing. Yeah. So it's like a basic form of social accountability, of positive peer pressure. And so that has, yeah, I've done that since 2004. And, and the one big thing that I've added to that system, uh, and I was inspired to, to do this by Tina Selig, who is a Stanford professor and who introduced me to the concept of the failure resume. She said, don't just create a resume that that talks about all your successes, you know, your job successes, your education successes. Create a failure resume that talks about all the things you tried to do and you failed. 
because that is still impressive also. And it actually humanizes you in a way that makes people trust you more easily because a resume can just be something where you, you ignore all the bad stuff and you just paint the good. But we are, we are each flawed human beings who all have good and bad sides. And so to really communicate who you are, she said, you should have a failure resume also. Yeah. Um, yeah, it just gets people, you know, she's a Silicon Valley kind of startup type person. And so she is all about learning through failure and rapid iteration. Uh, fail faster is the, the classic term from Silicon Valley. That's awesome. And like I said, when we open up those vulnerabilities, sometimes we come off as a little bit unapproachable. I love how you yeah. talk about that. It really does. It helps us with that networking that we're trying to do, you know, especially self-directed learners. Yeah. And the, the word networking just feels a little smarmy to me. It, it just helps you be a trustable person, yeah. like a real person. Yeah. Yeah. And so on my goal list, I list my failures also. And so, for example, right after graduating from college, I told myself I wanted to hike the Pacific Crest Trail, 2,600 miles. It takes five months. You hike from Mexico to Canada for weeks, and then I got off the trail. Like, I failed. I quit. And I did it because I finally discovered, I'm an introvert, but I finally discovered what too much alone time feels like. And so I still have the Pacific Crest Trail on my goal list, but it says, like, failed 2005. And so I think I'll go back and I'll still try to hike the Pacific Crest Trail, but maybe when I'm, when I'm older and in a different part of my life. Yeah. Uh, but Maybe when you have a wife and kids, share. that's on your goal list too, right? Yeah. Oh, they're, they're, <laughs> they're definitely going to be so awesome that they're going to come with me on the Pacific Crest <laughs> Trail. Like that's a clear intention that I have. That's so, awesome. So yeah, I, I've got a number of failures listed on there too. And, and, and that's, that's just been really good for me to like put myself out there like that on the internet. Great. Well, tell us some, about some of your future goals of what you're going to be doing, uh, hopefully, you know, in the upcoming months and years. Yeah, I'm still running a lot of unschooled adventures trips with teenagers. Uh, I'm actually, today is the first day of my staff training for a New Zealand trip, a six-week-long trip with 11 teenagers and two other staff to uh, venture on the South Island of New Zealand. So we're leaving in just a couple of days. It's, it's early February as we record this. And so uh, we'll be out there until mid-March. Um, I've got some personal travels in New Zealand and Argentina. I've got a big Argentina semester program in early 2017 for a, a slightly older age group. I'm playing with the gap year age range now. So sort of age 18 to 21. So I'm trying new programs all the time. There's a, a program that my good friend Matt is running called the Real World Retreat in May in Colorado, which is for ages 16 to 20. And we threw together a program in the attempt to uh, communicate everything that it, a young person needs to know to move out of their parents' house in one four week long retreat. Because we thought, man, what is like the one thing that a lot of young people uh, want to be able to do? And when we talk with all these homeschoolers and unschoolers, they say, I want to be able to move out of my parents' house. I want to live independently, but I have no idea how to do it, how to make enough money to do it, how to get a group of friends together so we can have an affordable communal living situation. Uh, you know, deal with stuff like applying to jobs and insurance. And, and so I'm really excited for that program, too. So I'm constantly developing these programs and throwing, throwing them at the wall and seeing what sticks. Uh, and then for me personally, I'm, I'm still really interested in writing, but I just don't feel like I know what's next at this point. And so I'm playing with some new writing concepts, writing about stuff that's not education. And I'm, I'm really happy doing this. I, I live my nomadic lifestyle. Uh, I pretty much hang around Lake Tahoe, California in the summers. I do a lot of trail running and backpacking and swimming in the lake. And that just keeps me really fresh. Uh, and in the winters, uh, that's when I dedicate more time to traveling, to living in cities, to doing stuff that's not so outdoorsy. So I'm, I'm 33. I could see myself continuing to do this for a good while longer. <laughs> it sounds like a lot of fun. So that's great. So have you thought about the legacy that you're hoping to leave? I mean, you are kind of a young guy, but... Yeah, I, th I thank you for the disclaimer, kind of young guy. Yeah, we can no longer say young. Uh, I still feel young, which is what matters. Most. Yeah, that does matter. <laughs> yeah, hanging out with teenagers for, you know, six weeks at a time definitely keeps me on the younger side of things. Uh, I think writing is 
uh, my favorite way to feel like I'm really contributing to the world, especially in a, in a more large scale way. Running these trips with small groups uh, makes me feel like I can make a good impact on a small number of people. But writing really lets me feel like I can I can get out there. And it's it's such a nice intrinsic reward to get emails from people who have read my books or articles and they and they write me and they say, I found this really helpful or this helped me make this decision. And that, you know, there's just nothing quite like that, getting that kind of feedback. And so I think writing is definitely going to be a, a long term focus for me. Yeah. Well, and one of the other things I've loved about your whole message is that that is a self-directed, I mean, it's definitely a free will type of thing that you're doing. You know, you're getting your ideas out there, but you're not forcing them on on the student or whatever, like you would in a school setting or something. So definitely making a difference yeah. that way. That's awesome. It's, it's- consensual yeah and, and john taylor gatto you know john taylor gatto's book is what really set me on this whole path and so you know books have a special place in my heart as potentially transformative objects in somebody's life exactly great well before we say goodbye do you have any final parting words for our listeners and then give us your contact information of how our audience can get in touch with you i have no words of wisdom or parting advice whatsoever and instead i'd say yeah Go onto my webpage, BlakeBowles.com, B-O-L-E-S, and I have uh, I send out an email newsletter once every two weeks where I share my favorite links. A lot of it's related to education and some of it's related to other stuff, and I share updates from my own life and whatever writing I'm up to or traveling that I'm doing, and so that's like a really good, you know, low uh, impact way to keep up with what I'm doing. And I'd say that's the one thing I'd want your listeners to do is sign up for my email list. Great. Did we already discuss that you have some options available for young people or for training yeah. or things like that? Well, uh, yeah, Unschooled Ventures. The okay. website is un- unschooladventures.com. And that's where you can find about all these teen trips and these young adult programs that I'm running. And we've almost never run the same trip twice. And so there's always new offerings coming out. There's a between two to three different programs a year. And there's also a separate email list if you want to get notifications about when we offer new trips. And so for anyone who has teenagers or uh, other young adults in their lives, definitely check out Unschool Adventures because we we run some pretty amazing life-changing programs. Great. Well, Blake, it has been an absolute pleasure for me to talk to you. I really appreciate your time. This has been a lot of fun, Rebecca. Great conversation. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Blake Bowles and his unschooling adventures, go to our show notes at theluminousmind.net. Be sure to become a subscriber to our free email list and get our new monthly newsletter. Then check out our services tab to see how we can continue to assist you, our fire starters. Also, to help us continue production of inspiring content, go to the sponsor tab at theluminousmind.net for more information on sponsorship and affiliate programs. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Google+, and now Pinterest. Get our free audio content by subscribing on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. To help us grow, consider these easy ways. Tell your friends about us. Leave us a review. Share our content. Tell us how we can help you so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. 